Good morning. Saturday morning. Hello. Good morning, world. For all of you who's having a lion, you can catch up, I'm sure. Isn't that waterfall gorgeous? Look at that beautiful, beautiful waterfall. A glorious day. Oh, wonderful. Good morning, dragon. Something I can't see with my glasses on. Dare to fly coaching. Hello, dare to fly coaching. Good morning. Look at this wonderful view. Morning, Chris. Are you an Aaron or are you on the M6, buddy? Look at that beautiful view. Wait till we get a couple of people on. Folk are probably having a, a little Saturday morning lion. Right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. I'll continue. Good morning. I hope you are well on this fine day. Saturday morning. I've got no idea what date it is. Morning, Francis. I've been thinking about you this morning, Francis, on my walk. I'm, I'm really pleased for you. The news you shared with me yesterday. Okay. Wow. New day, new day, it's a new dawn, that is for sure. So, fear of change. We've got two viewers. What does that tell us? It tells us people either are quite happy being stuck in their misery or they're still lying in their beds, sleeping. Um, right, so fear of change. And the mind doesn't want us to change. The mind wants us to stay stuck. So, the subconscious mind is to the mind what the immune system is to the gut. The subconscious mind is to the mind what the immune system is to the gut. It can be very limiting, but it was also set up to protect us. Morning, Cairn. Sorry I never get back to you. I did actually speak to the girl about her exhaust, um, but she would need somebody to fit it, and I'm not that soldier. But uh, anyway, sorry I never phoned you back. Just, just disappeared with me. Right. So, my lesson, the lesson, omnipotent narcissistic Ross talking about himself, but I hope it helps. So, I'm... I'm, uh, I'm buddies. Morning, everybody. Morning, Carella. Morning, Cairn. Morning, Jack. Mr. Naismith. Nice number, by the way. Jyn 19 something, 1965 Jyn. Lovely. Be present from Daddy, was it? Right. So, I'm friends on Facebook with my lecturer from university that took me through my postgraduate in counselling, right? And he was a, he's a lovely man, elderly gentleman, beautiful, kind heart and face, and very, very clever. And I had a lot of projections on him. I projected onto him the grandfather, the father, lots of things. I had respect for him. But in a lot of ways, not through his behaviour, through my understanding of him there was fear in that respect I was scared of him because he was just so good at his job you know he was just like such an amazing psychoanalytic psychotherapist and he was my lecturer at uni he's not been on Facebook he obviously had an account and I asked him to become friends on Facebook a number of years ago and just since the beginning of this uh, lockdown he has Join Facebook, okay? 
So when it popped up, this chap and Ross I Slip are now friends, my gut sank, my absolute gut sank, right? Morning, Lindsay. It was nice to see you in uh, Tesco's last night. You were looking great. Um, should I say that online? I did think about stopping and picking you up with the, with the pram and the way down Whiteley's Road. Anyway, so I became chums with my lecturer from university through Facebook. I had a massive amount of respect for this guy, but I had a massive amount of fear because I compared myself to him and I thought I could never be the therapist that he is. He's just amazing, wonderful guy, fantastic. And I know and I own a lot of projections that I had on him as the grandfather and the, the father. Anyway, long story short, I started doing these Facebook live videos, ra ra ra, laddie daddy, and then he becomes my friend on Facebook. My gut sank, going to absolute terrified fear. I'm like that, oh no, what if he watches my videos? Oh man, what if he watches my videos and he hears me swearing in them? What if, oh no, right? So, when after that, I started really monitoring my language, right? I monitored how I was saying things. And I noticed that I then started to become a wee bit more rigid. So, out of all the people that I've sent a message to and asked them to come on and join me on the couch and Facebook Live, oh, heavens forbid, I've got Jay Gunkelman coming on on Monday night, man. He's like one of the top, easily one of the top ten or certainly one of the top five people in the world in uh, brain sciences and neurofeedback and consciousness and Wow, I just pinged him a message. Never gave it a thought. But when I pinged my lecturer, this is how I know there's projection in there. But I've known that for years. I've, I've spoke about it before with, with, with therapists that I've seen. I had a lot of projections on my, my lecturer at uni, right? So when I sent him out and I extended an invitation to him, I held my breath and I dissociated, I dissociated a little bit because I thought, oh, I don't really want to know the answer to this, right? So, long story short, yesterday, ping a message come in from him, and I saw the message, oh God, felt that trigger in my tummy, felt the fear, and um, I didn't open it, I didn't open it straight away, I waited a while, right, and I kept trying to peek at the message and see if I could look down through the through the two-dimensional screen and see if I could get a wee feel of what he was saying in it. Anyway, no, 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 and I went, right, Ross, just pull on your big boy pants and open the message. So I opened the message from him, and it was so sweet. It was a lovely, lovely message. And he commended me for the work that I've been doing. And he commended me for the energy, positivity, etc. And that the people that I've been interviewing are lovely, and that he approved I got approval, right? God, I'm going to start greeting, thinking about this. Oh, God. Wow, that hit me. I never realised that was going to be as hard. <sighs> Let me get my head together here. Um, right, I got approval. I felt approved. Which got me thinking about... Why does this tie into Fury Change? Those of you that are listening, they're like, what is he babbling on about, right? A lot of times we fear change is because we're... And a lot of the behaviours that we're doing that's not necessarily who we are is because we seek approval. We're looking for approval. God, I'm sorry, my head's went all over the place after thinking about that. I hadn't really... Um, right, get myself back in the game here. So when I got this message from my lecturer at uni that said it was okay, which kind of said that I was okay, I've never had that before. And I guess I've been looking for that all my life. I've been looking for approval, I've been looking for somebody to put their hand on my shoulder and tell me it's all going to be all right. And out of all the people, and I value and respect many, it was just highlighted how, to me yesterday how much projection that I had placed on this lecturer at uni. And 
when I say how much I valued him, I think through his boundaries, through his sternness, his capacity to hold himself, that was probably one of the first times in my life that I got to meet myself. I got to meet myself through being a student of this guy's. And that's, I, I mark that as one of my greatest achievements, actually. Uh, it was the very last postgraduate course that he ran at Queen Margaret University. And I am um, absolutely honour it. I've went way off track since I started talking about him. I apologise, right? Bringing it back together again. It's a fear of change and the mind doesn't want you to change. Now, the subconscious mind where all our habits and beliefs and behaviours repressed, emotions and feelings and anger, hurt, sadness and resentments have all been placed. Unfortunately, we start projecting those um, programmes out into our environment and we start living them and then we blame the outer world. We start, it gives us validation and we start to blame the outer world and we want the outer world to change. When in actual fact... The work that we need to do is on the inner world. We need to make the inner world change. We're always pointing a finger outside to the other world. When they change, when they do this, I'll be better. When they do that, right? I had a wonderful session yesterday with a, a guy that I sponsor in Narcotics Anonymous. And uh, we, we had a real hoot. Stephen, brilliant guy. He's doing fantastic. Been a year clean. And we were just talking about certain things. And I... We got to a place where I was stuck. I was stuck in what to say to the guy. And I said, I'm going to quote Kevin, right? And I quoted and took Pravatum with this guy that I used to work beside a colleague. Him and I worked together in a place. And I quoted Kevin by the book because I've took on so much of what Kevin said. And I said it to the guy and the guy got it and he understood it. And... Um, I said, and now that you've understood that, what are you going to do? And he said, X, Y, and Z. And I says, well, if you're going to do that, I'll give you my commitment that what I'm going to do is I'm going to text Kevin and I'm going to tell Kevin how much I value him, right? I says, I don't want to, but I am. And I did. I sent Kevin a text and I told him how much I valued him and how much I valued his work and how much I valued more than anything his recovery because that guy's got it, he really, really has, he works his programme and he makes an amazing job of it. What do I respect about that? I respect that anybody that can get their self out of their comfort zone and move towards a new being, a new sense of self, that doesn't come for free, that doesn't come for nothing. You might sit in the house and keep smoking dope and drinking beer and looking at these videos and going, He's an absolute fanny. What is he talking about? What does he know? Right? Probably in a domestically violent relationship. You know, treats his wife like she's a skivvy. She shouts about at him. There's no connection. There's no love. They don't make love together any longer. That's a great life, isn't it? Right? They don't experience what it's like to go on what I describe as a hero's journey, a quest to break down all those false perceptions of reality that you take as real. You think it's habitually normal to speak to your wife the way you do or for your wife to speak to her husband the way she does. It's normal to be married and be, you know, unless it's, unless of course it's agreed, but in a marriage where there's no sex, there's no love, there's no intimacy, the only time you feel connected is on a Friday night when you've drank a bottle of wine together. Okay, that old pattern and that habit you want to keep doing that? That's your choice. And you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a hero that steps up out of their paradigm, out of their perception, out of their reality, and steps towards something new, okay? Steps towards a new way of being. Morning, Christine. How are you? Sorry I never got out for a roll. I will. I'll definitely. I've got to jump my wee monkey bite and come out and get a roll and egg wee and get a bladder. And, um... I just, I've just been, I've just been kind of writing, writing reports and stuff like that. I've just been kind of getting, in, getting on with it. I've got the energy to do it now, so get it done. 
Okay, so I'm jumping about a wee bit because I'm like Billy Connolly and I go away in tangents. Not going to make excuses for my mind. But are you ready to step up and awaken? Because that's what it is. It's an awakening process. If you've been running your old scripts and schemas and narratives that are fundamentally unconscious and perhaps subconscious, okay, you want to run those scripts and schemas, then the past is always present and the present, the moment that you're in, is based on the past and you're actually not living in the now, you're living in the constructs of somewhere between, you know, third trimester in pregnancy and seven years old, right? Seven-year-olds have tantrums, seven-year-olds shout at their wife, seven-year-olds talk to their wife that they're like a skivvy and vice versa, women, women, you talk to your guys like that, you tell them they're useless, tell your pals, oh, he's useless, doesn't he do anything. Disney know because you're in a fight you're in what's called a power struggle you want to stay in that power struggle that's cool you want to wake up you want to start thinking a wee bit differently you don't know how that's going to look you don't know what that's going to be like okay it might mean that you're separated it might mean that you live apart it might mean that things change if you can do it from an adult perspective there'll be love there'll be connection and there'll be honesty right so as a good pal of mine for the past Richie said to me, I met him the other day there. Don't see him very often. Right, but see, when I do see him, his words of wisdom are just fantastic. Helped me out a great deal around about some stuff I had going on with my daughter. Phenomenal advice he gave me. And he gave me a great bit of advice the other morning there at the bottom of the high street at the petrol station. He says, Ross, don't let the haters pull you in. He says, there's always going to be somebody who's going to say something about you. And he says, you're doing a grand job. Back to acceptance again. However... It never came as strong and as hard as last night when I opened the message for my lecturer at university. Right. See, can't even talk about it without welling up. He approved. He gave me approval, which in a roundabout way allowed me to approve myself. He's just a regular guy, I'm sure. I'm sure he's had his trials. I'm sure he's had his problems. I'm sure he's had all of these things. But I had him on a pedestal. As I said the other day there about the Wizard of Oz, truth comes from authority. I had projected onto him that he was supernatural, that he was better than me, that he was. And in order for me to have the respect that I did for him, I had to place him in that place because I've been taught to respect that which is outside of me, which I've learned was fear-based. When I can get to a place where I respect and honour myself, I can respect and honour another person without having them on a pedestal, without having them on this greater place. So yesterday morning, I had nothing to say, I had nothing to give. I was absolutely burst. And I got my stuff on and I kept running and I got down and I shaved 10 minutes off my time. And that 10 minutes gave me a big zap of dopamine and that then, within the last three minutes, gave me some content to talk about this morning. Similarly, it's Friday, got to the end of the week. Um, that's 40 odd mile I've walked this week. Every morning, my body's tired. Get off my, get off my martyr zone here, take my cross, come down off my cross, right? When I got that text message from my lecturer that I had placed so much fear on, so much fear around his answer. He's the only person that I've asked to come on live with me and have a chat that I was terrified of his answer. Right? When he gave me that approval last night, I was like a child. I had this, like, come in at half nine, you know what I mean? I got this lease of life. And I just, I felt young and I felt giddy and I felt happy because his message allowed me to connect with myself. And I guess what I'm saying is that we're all looking for approval. We're all looking for that person to say, you're doing a good job. And the meaning that we place upon that person, when they do give us the approval and say we're doing a good job, the meaning that we've placed upon that person then gives us a lift. For a lot of us that we're looking for it from our fathers that aren't with us anymore. The lesson that I learned last night and what I'm going to work on today and tomorrow is that 
there's only one person that has to approve of you. And that's yourself. Self-acceptance and self-approval. I try and be as transparent as possible. And, you know, clients that are in the clutches of addiction come to me and think I've got it all sorted out. Well, I started my journey of recovery 27 years ago now in April 1993 and I've been completely sober and drug-free since uh, 2006. July 2016, the park, I went up to see the Who and I had half a pint of lager and that was it, it was over. I haven't been out my banger since the new year, 2005 into 2006, when I took myself to a place which was extremely destructive. And that was it, that was the last. I played with it from 1993 to 2006, you know, I was in and out and in and out and in and out. And the first step for change is acceptance. Acceptance that you're powerless over drugs and alcohol. Acceptance that you're powerless over your life. Acceptance that your, your life has become unmanageable. And this one here. Acceptance that yourself. You're all the man you're ever going to be. Don't wait for the outside world to create something for you. Step towards it and make it happen. God will move mountains for you as long as you walk towards them with a shovel. Through doing these videos, what I've felt and what I've went through and certainly gone through the 12 steps again so quickly, it brought up a massive amount of stuff for me. And that's cool, I get through it. But I used to care what folk Lanark thought of me because I'd done, you know, a lot of stupid things. You know, the funny thing about it now is, see all the folk that used to point their finger at me? They're still secret closet snorters, but don't tell anybody that. You know, they're middle class now, they've got families and they've got children, but they <sighs> wait the bogs and they have a wee snoot here and there. Right? So, through doing the steps, I never realised how much resentment I had about all they folk that post on Facebook that they're super fit and they're out with the kids and they're doing all this stuff, they're doing all this... You know, they're cyclers or they're this or they're jolly good sports and we're, we're doing this stuff for charity now. And they've got all these programmes going on. But secretly, they're running away into the toilet, isolating themselves, hiding in the, hiding in the toilet, snorting cocaine. They're caught in that duality place where they're trying to pretend to the world that they're all right. Yet they're feeding, they're still feeding the addict within them. And that makes me feel a wee bit better about myself because I know what I am. I know. And that's the first step that I'm sharing with you. Is start to know who you are, start to accept who you are, and start to make the changes that you need to make in order to have the best life that's for you. Doesn't mean to say that you're going to have loads of money. Who needs money? Doesn't mean to say that you're going to have a flashy car or a big house. Don't go looking for the perfect relationship with the perfect man out there, because it doesn't exist. And men, don't go looking for the perfect relationship with the perfect woman out there. It doesn't exist. The only person that you need to have a relationship with is yourself. Because what we do is we go into a relationship and we give that other person the keys to our garden. We let them in. We do that. We, we sacrifice ourselves to give them, give it over to them. And then we get that person... We give them the keys to our kingdom. We give them the keys to our garden. They then come along with their lawnmower and their shears and they start cutting your garden, right? Make a nice job of it and all the rest of it. And then one day we wake up and we see that they've cut all the, sh all the hedges into chickens and horses, horses and chickens and cows and clouds and all that. And that they've been doing our garden all zigzagging and crossed. And we go, what are you doing to my garden? Right, and we blame them for the way that we've taken that they've, that they've taken care of our garden. We blame our partner for the way that they've taken care of our garden. Okay, that was never their responsibility, and you were the one that gave them the keys to it. So, the difficult step here as we start moving out of fear of change is that you can actually take care of your own garden. You can actually look after your own shrubs, rockeries, conifers etc, etc, etc. I'm wishing you a blessed and pleasant day. Um, Saturday, someday in April, I've got no idea. 
and uh, I uh, hope you have a great day with your loved ones and with yourself. Take care, thanks for watching and uh, peace out, all the best.